an industrial strobe off eBay. And I have to say, taking the thumbnail for this video was a lot easier than normal than I'd expected because I thought this was going to flash. And usually when you're taking pictures of flashing things, you have to take several pictures until you catch one with it lit. But this one ain't flashing. I thought it was going to flash. It does seem to have act for circuitry visible through there. I would have thought it would flash. Anyway, this is a 12 volt strobe. Let me hook it up to 12 volts and show you it not flashing. So positive to red, negative to white. Turn it on and it lights up bright blue. Reason enough. Let's open it up and see, is it supposed to flash? What is wrong with it? Spudger. I thought initially, there's little uh, indents aside, I thought this was going to twist off. I think I'm going to have to spudger it off. Hopefully it's not glued on. So this uh, came from eBay, rather predictably. It's a uh, it's designed for industrial applications where a machine might have multiple colours of strobes. Um, it might have a blue strobe. I'm not sure why. It might be a warning. Uh, it might have a green strobe to show a process is complete. Yellow strobe to show that something's gone wrong, like maybe materials have run out. And red strobe for a fault has occurred somewhere in the safety circuit. Um, the first thing I'm seeing looking at this is this huge blob of solder there. That doesn't look right. Where's my magnifier? Let's use this magnifier. That is a surface mount transistor that has a huge blob of solder on it. That's odd. What's its function here? I don't think that looks right. No, because there's the chip that's obviously doing the flashing. It looks like a microcontroller. Could be wrong. Uh, and that is going to that transistor. That is wrong. Tell you what, let's, uh, let's get the solder iron on. One moment, please. The solder iron is hot. I think we're ready to begin this, so I shall just touch a little bit of fresh, juicy lead-based solder onto this, and I shall heat this up and see if we can budge this component. Oh, that's just moved right off. That was very convenient. Oh, right, okay. That is splattered everywhere. Yeah, that is supposed... Look at that. It's supposed to have the... Uh, it's supposed to have the, the base here. I tell you what, let's uh, re-solder that then. So what I'll do is this little surface mount component is absolute blobbed. It might not even be, a, it might not even have survived this ordeal because it's been the subject to a massive blob of solder. Let's get that little bit of solder off there from that side. Let's uh, get some desoldering wick and remove the solder off those pads and apply fresh solder to one of them and then if I have not lost that little component I shall uh, actually I could no no I'll just I'll, I'll solder one of the leads that's what I want to do let's get this component the right way around this is where my big fumbly fingers are no good with surface mount. Up, oh, see what I mean? I just dropped it. It's so easy to drop, but it's infinitely better than ping across the room. Right, hold on, let me shovel this in. You see, this is not Lewis Rossman or Northridge Fix. It is not one of these channels where they have expertise in soldering footry wee things. Right, tell you what, that looks like it's gone into the right place. Now I'm going to add a little bit of flux, approximately one millipod of flux. And this is going to let me just then apply. Normally I, I don't recommend carrying solder across. This is a very sticky, gooey flux. Normally I don't uh, recommend carrying solder across to components, but in the case of these little surface mount components, once you've tacked it down, that is the best way to do this. Uh, so the flux is now on the component itself and I shall scoop a bit of solder onto the solder iron and then when I touch it to that pin it should hopefully transfer in and solder that down. Let's go around the other side. Uh, same again, there's still solder on this. That should hopefully have gone onto that pad. And then, just for good measure, I shall whiz it round the other way. See, this is where one of Lewis Rossman's microscopes would be really handy. I shall reflow that. Now, theoretically, 
If I have done things correctly, where is the power supply? Black to white, red to red. Is this going to work? Power. Uh, power supply on would be quite handy. One moment, please. Uh, I'll warn in advance. I don't know how fast this is going to flash. If it's going to flash at all. It's flashing. That's fine. Okay. Now we've fixed it. We can continue with the project and I shall take some pictures of this and we shall reverse engineer it. One moment, please. Here is a picture of the circuit board. You may also notice that the strobes are multiplying. There are now two strobes. The reason for that is that one of them, the DC one, the 12 volt DC one, just as a resistor and capacitor in the back. This one is a 220 to 240 volt one and it is a drop of capacitor a resistor and a couple of capacitors on the back. The circuit board, however, if you compare the circuit boards, they're pretty much identical for both. There's very little difference other than certain components. So things worthy of note. The capacitor normally sits at the back of here on this side of a bridge rectifier. In the 12 volt one, that capacitor is not used, but they have included the bridge rectifier, which is also not used, which means they could have run this off 12 volt AC. But there's a reason they've, they've just put the 12 volts on this side. And there's also that little one mega ohm discharge resistor across that drop capacitor for the higher voltage ones. We have a resistor hidden under here that's a 10 watt, a uh, 10 ohm, 2 watt resistor. I reckon it's 2 watt. And then we have a smoothing capacitor position. And in the case of the 12, 12 volt unit, the smoothing capacitor is here. But in the case of the mains voltage unit, it's kind of spread across these connections. I think that's because they've used a slightly bigger capacitor. 220 uh, microfarad 25 volt and there may not be enough depth in the case so they've actually put it flat and they've just connected to these pads there is a 7805 voltage regulator and then there's a decoupling capacitor across that that soldering doesn't look great there does it um but on the 240 volt one there's another smoothing capacitor on this side on the 5 volt side there's a microcontroller with just three pins connected. The other ones are just floating in thin air. It's only got three pins connected, uh, zero volt, five volts, and then the output going through a 1K resistor to a Y1 transistor, which then switches three circuits of LEDs. There are one, two, three, four LEDs in series with a 120 ohm resistor. And that is more or less it. Let's go to the circuit diagram. So I've got both versions on the same diagram here. In the case of the 12 volt one, the 12 volt connections are to here. Now they could have put the 12 volt connections on the other side of the rectifier and it means it could have been 12 volt AC or it wouldn't have mattered the polarity. But unusually, they've got four LEDs in series and the three volt LEDs, they should have said the blue LEDs and the white ones, in this case, phosphor yellow, will add up to the best part of 12 volts, so the 120 ohm resistors won't be dropping much. If they'd put the 12 volt DC on the other side of this, the rectifier would potentially have dropped uh, over a volt, and that would have actually affected the intensity greatly. So in the case of the uh, DC ones, it is connected there and there. It goes through this uh, current limiting resistor, if it's more than 12 volts, this Zener diode will clamp it down to roughly 12 volts. Then it's got the smoothing capacitor. Then it goes to the 78L05 voltage regulator, a really common regulator, not dealing with much current in this instance. It goes over to that little decoupling capacitor uh, and that optional 220 microfarad capacitor. I wonder why they did that. Maybe the input from the main side was a bit spiky and it was crashing the processor. But the little microcontroller just has three pins connected. It has a resistor going to the Y1 transistor and then it switches the three clusters of LEDs. The mains voltage one is different. Both of them have that little one mega ohm resistor. Both of them have the rectifier. But in this instance, they, it has a 820 nanofarad 400 volt capacitor there with that one mega ohm discharge resistor across it. It feeds the bridge rectifier through this current limiting resistor, which in this instance is just an inrush limiter. And then it's capped to about 12 volts by the Zener diode, and then everything is the same. So one of them is a capacitive dropper, one of them doesn't, and there's no difference in price. So if you were wanting to get one and we didn't know what you were going to be using it for 12 volt or 240, you could just get the this one and you could actually just 
hook a couple of leads on the 12 volt the output the rectifier um, and just hack and modify these to suit if you were so inclined you probably wouldn't do that certainly not in the factory environment you just unless you were desperate you'd just order these and i have to say these ones came from ebay there's only about two pounds different tops uh, getting it from cpc an industrial supplier in the uk so not really that much difference but that's more or less it it's very simple. It's almost ridiculous they're using a microcontroller to do the flashing, but when it comes to crunch, it provides a nice consistent flash speed, a perfect 50-50 on-off ratio. They could have used a 555 with components. In this instance, they chose a microcontroller. It's probably cheaper in the long run. And the program in that might be something like initialize the, the internal files and registers. It would be turn the LEDs on, uh, call a delay timer, turn them off, uh, call a delay timer and then go to the start again. It would just be a really simple routine. But there we go. They're quite neat. They work okay. Let me show you the 240 volt one going because if I don't, you will not be pleased with me because everybody likes to see everything tried out. Let's get the hoppy. And we shall jam its wires recklessly into the hoppy here and see what it's... Uh, power consumption is like. So here's a little hoppy. Here's a circuit board. It's not got anything loose at the back of it because it will be live at mains voltage. It's flashing away. The hoppy says, let me just see if I can uh, brighten this up. That was a terrible idea. Uh, it's 0.8 watts. It's drawing on average 64 milliamps. Power factor is absolutely miserable at 0 0.05, but I would expect that because it is converting 240 down to 12 volts, 246 volts. Um, but it's very low power, but amply bright enough, it looks fine. Certainly in a factory environment, you'd easily see that flashing away. I shall just gingerly pull these wires out of here while the power's on. How foolish of me. But there we go. Um, I'm pretty sure I took a strobe apart before. I can't remember if I did or not. I'm pretty sure I took a, an industrial strobe part for it, and it was very different to these. But this design has kind of evolved. It's just gone to, a, it's a sensible design of strobe with the ring of LEDs, the surface mount LEDs. It's optimized for manufacture and a universal circuit board that does everything. So pretty neat. Uh, so there we go. If you need strobes your machines to so they can summon you when they need assistance or tell you when things are finished. Well, this is what you got. Standard industrial strobes available in red, orange, or red, yellow, green, and blue. Presumably the red will be phosphor as well, but I'm not really sure about that. Maybe I'll order a red one. Maybe I'll order one from CBC to see what it looks like too.